Welcome, you're watching Views and News, and I'm Faisal Rahman, live from our Islamabad studio. Today, we'll be talking about the very important visit of our uh, foreign minister, Faj Asif, to Iran, where he met Mr. Jawad Zarif, the uh, foreign minister of Iran, and also met uh, Mr. Rouhani, uh, the president of Iran. They uh, had a very productive uh, meeting there. It was a one-day visit, and uh, he was accompanied by the National Security Advisor, General Janjua, as well as the Secretary uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, Tehmina Janjua. So, considering uh, what happened there, and uh, the primary agenda was about the Afghan issue. Now, one important uh, issue that is going to be the main topic of our discussion today is going to be about the statement that was issued. Rather, it was a joint statement that all these stakeholders, all those countries which are the neighbors of Afghanistan, should be on the same page. And interestingly and unfortunately, the Americans are there and uh, they plan to stay there and they've blamed Pakistan uh, for uh, backing the militants or the Taliban there. And they've also said that Iran is doing the same. So primarily, uh, one of the concern is very mutual on that regard. Secondly, prior to that, the uh, foreign minister was in China where uh, he held a very important meeting with his counterpart and got all the support they could have had uh, from the Chinese government. We'll be talking about that also. But interestingly now, a couple of very important facts. Unless until there's proper intelligence sharing between Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran, you can't solve this issue. Mm -hmm. And war itself is a problem, it's not a solution. And when you're looking for a solution in Afghanistan, obviously we always say it should be Afghan led, Afghan owned, these two words. I mean, I fail to understand what exactly they mean by that because it's, it is technically American-led and American-owned, or rather the Indian or the American-led and Indian and the American-owned uh, uh, formula. But that is not working. Uh, it has been 16, 17 years now that they're using extensive force there, but nothing uh, has been done. Rather, according to certain very interesting sources, we have learned that it's not 40 to 45 or maybe 50% of the area that is under the control of the Taliban. It's more than 60%. And you're not talking about the area bordering Iran or, or for that matter, Pakistan. I'm talking about the northern Afghanistan. So that is of prime concern also. We'll be talking about that. Let me introduce you to our uh, uh, panelists. We have with us on my right is AVM retired uh, Bhatti Sap, a very known defense analyst. Sir. Thank you very much. We also have with us uh, Ambassador Kiani Sap, sir. Thank you very much. And we have with us Professor uh, Kaab Malik. Thank you very much, Dr. Sap, uh, for being here. First of all, Bhatti Sap, uh, since um, it was understood, if you remember, Ms. Wells was supposed to come to Pakistan and then uh, we asked her to delay uh, the visit because uh, A, the chief wasn't here, the uh, PM wasn't here as well. The interesting part was that uh, later on, it was decided by the foreign office that the uh, new foreign minister is going to visit China. He's also going to visit Iran. And most likely, he's going to visit Moscow also. And this could be the third important visit. Uh, obviously, when you talk about the current position, obviously, a lot of blame by the Americans in particular, uh, they're putting that on Pakistan, A. Eh? For their failure, they're blaming Pakistan. And to some extent, Iran, but one thing is mutual here that they say that Pakistan and Iran both are actually supporting the Taliban. And they need to do more. Now, in particular, we need to do more. But at the same time, there comes a statement from the Chief of Army Staff, and that also on the 6th of September, that we have done enough. And now it's time for them to do more. Let's not blame Pakistan for everything. For your failures, let's not blame us. Sir, let's start off from there. All right, we, we were talking of the visit of the foreign minister to these uh, four regional countries, China, Russia, uh, Iran, and Turkey. Now, this is a, a very uh, positive uh, initiative that Pakistan has, is, is taking, or is in the process of taking, uh, in, in, in the backdrop of a very serious allegation uh, that the American president has uh, have or had leveled against Pakistan. And I think it has uh, several positive uh, outcomes on the visit that is being undertaken. Firstly, of course, uh, Pakistan will have an opportunity to share its viewpoint vis-a-vis uh, -vis its uh, relationship with Afghanistan, its role in the war that is going on for the last 16 years, and any concerns that regional countries have uh, on this subject vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. Of course, it is going to in, uh, build the mutual confidence, mutual trust with the host country wherever uh, the foreign minister goes. Besides, of course, uh, sharing of the concerns uh, of Pakistan, the interests of Pakistan, and alleviating any concerns that the host country might have. And at the end of the day, after having visited all these four countries, Pakistan would be able to come up with a very uh, 
wholesome, uh, a very acceptable and a very effective kind of a policy and a response vis-a-vis. -vis. So when you say effective and acceptable, would you like to please throw light on this particular? Because, you see, uh, uh, the stakeholders are the regional countries because they are they're bordering Afghanistan. America as such is not a stakeholder uh, generi uh, genetically because uh, uh, it, it had come here uh, uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, follow up to the 9-11 episode and it, it wanted to... And interestingly course, today is the 16th. And uh, they, they, <laughs> yeah, they, have, uh, they have eliminated Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. their, their objective has been achieved and uh, now they have no reason to stay. But they have discovered other reasons now. They say wherever there is a threat, we will go after them. Exactly. And uh, the Afghan Taliban are no threat to America. They have no designs beyond the borders of Afghanistan. And uh, interestingly, Afghanistan, uh, America has not even declared them as a terrorist country, uh, as, as a terrorist organization, sorry. And they even have allowed their office in, in Qatar. And uh, they, are, they are having regular interactions, exchange of views and ideas and uh, discussions and if that be the case why are they blaming pakistan for supporting them when you are, when they are themselves in in communication with them and uh, they, they they are saying that pakistan is providing safe havens to them as you just mentioned they they already have 60% of the territory within afghanistan they don't 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 need, don't need to go anywhere outside pa afghanistan they don't need to come to pakistan they have enough space over there Settle your own score first and then talk about the, yes. the, the other factors. So, yes. so if that be the case, uh, I mean, they are just finding justification to stay there. So primarily, uh, what I've understood so far, so it's been like so many years that you know we've been talking about this particular uh, problem. Ambassador Sub now, mm -hmm. looking at the, the current situation and, and, and considering it's not Obama there, it's Mr. Trump who has a very different philosophy, who's taken a lot of U-turns as far as the U.S. policy is concerned, whether you talk about NAFTA or you talk about Mexico or you talk about global warming or you talk about Palestinian issue or you talk about let's suppose Afghanistan. Uh, now sir, this man has certain designs and he, I mean it seems that whatever the Indians dictate him, he totally 100% absorbs that and then comes out with his own statement and designs his own policy. And a lot of people believe that instead of talking to sane people, he is just, I'm not saying that men in uniform are not sane, what I'm saying is that He's just listening to them and they have got one way forward and that is the use of military force. They haven't succeeded in the last 16 years and they will not succeed for another 160 years if they continue to follow the same policy. So your take on that. First of all, <clears throat> I think uh, before I uh, venture to, response, uh, to respond to your question, Sir. let me say today is a very sad day. Today is 9-11 and it is a day Believe, believe it or not, we thought where those two incidents on that day caused the life. I'm not going to get into the politics of it, did they do it or not, but a lot of precious lives were lost. And then so the world changed. Absolutely. Like before Christ and after Christ. The global the, dynamics the, changed. The, totally. the world is not the same. Thousands of lives have been lost. Many countries totally dismantled. They are not functioning anymore. You look at what's happening in Syria and Iraq and, and Libya. Libya especially. Those countries are not the same. So I think let's not forget. And it has a direct relevance to and connection with Afghanistan. Those troops arrived and it's been 17 years, you said, they're not going anywhere. So this is something which we need to ponder. And we were the direct, you know, victims, we, actually. victims of, of that. Of what happened in New York and what happened to us. So we are still reeling from those those incidents. Now coming down to what you have said, sir. First of all, sir, let me commend this government. I can take the credit for it. And Faisal, you have been a witness and you have been supporting me. We've been saying it on this floor the past many months that for Afghanistan, the government of Pakistan should consult the, the direct stakeholders, which is Iran, definitely Iran, and possibly also we, he might also visit Afghanistan, maybe a later stage. Yes. And then uh, Russia, China, and Turkey. Why not Turkey? Because Turkey, if you remember, it is the initiator of the heart of Africa, uh, heart of Asia. of Asia conference, which dealt with Afghanistan. So it is in the right direction. So let us commend this government for having sent 
a politician as a foreign minister to these countries. Because, sir, remember, now he just, he's just, I think he's an Iran and he'd be leaving for Turkey. Iran is a very sensitive country, sir. We have, you know, decades of relations with, with, with Iran. We have so much commonalities. It's a country just just come out of an isolation, of decades of isolation. And it is a direct stakeholder in the stability, the political stability of Afghanistan. Whatever happens in Afghanistan, they are, they are a direct. And if, if I cannot be wrong, Americans have been dealing with Iran behind the scenes for for quite some, for quite some time regarding Afghanistan. So the right direction, going to China, China a very close friend, and the whatever the fallout of the BRICS was, I think the Chinese have made, have assured Pakistan, yes, we, are, we stand by you regarding especially the fight against terrorism and whatever you do in Afghanistan, we stand by you. And then they have gone to Iran. And they have met something very important. They have met not only the foreign minister, they have met president the president. Rouhani. Uh, president Rouhani doesn't give, you know, uh, audience. Uh, the audience to Tom, Dick and Harry's. So it's very important. And he took, and especially very important, the, the foreign minister took the foreign secretary. I think I see another lady, I think the additional secretary, UN, Mr. Sneem, if I'm not Tasneem wrong. Mr. Sneem Aslam. Mr. Aslam. And then he took the national security advisor. So a good team has gone. Then they will now go to, 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 to Turkey. And then to Moscow. So when the foreign minister visits the United States, inshallah, very soon, he will be, he'll have all the information which is necessary. Instead of just giving their own opinion, he can say, when he talks about Afghanistan, he says, sir, look, this is what the country, this, these direct stakeholders and indirect stakeholders, look what they want in Afghanistan. It is very important to address and the global audience. Absolutely. And from that absolutely. Platform, and sir, yes. this is something important. And sir, I will once again say to you, going to Iran, are mending fences and building trust. This is something which we have been saying on this forum for a long time and the government done it and sir, we should commend the government. Same point to you, sir. How, how do you see this, sir, from your own prism? <coughs> I think it's important. Um, I'm not a diplomat, so I think uh, my colleague here has uh, mentioned things in the right framework. <coughs> um, I see it in a different dimension. I've always seen things differently. Um, I look at the geostrategic issues uh, that Pakistan has to engage with and the power play between different countries. And Afghanistan has unfortunately been at the center of this for the last 40 years. Uh, a play of power between the US and the Soviet Union, for example. And then, unfortunately, it denigrated into a civil war and a wretched condition within its own country until, uh, and which, which was a, a proxy war for neighboring states and other states outside. Uh, which didn't allow it to come out of its own problems. And Pakistan has been at the center of this also because we, we were helping defend, uh, our from our perspective, uh, Afghan freedom when the Soviets invaded and then afterwards. So we're, we're, we're directly involved from the beginning and we do have a stake in this. And without us, there is no peace. And I can guarantee that. Uh, and although you said that uh, uh, United States is an extra-regional country, it does have stakes. It's, it's said it's occupied, and you can't get rid of it unless they, have a par, a par, they are party to these talks. I think the only future, only future, and I think Donald Trump, the President of the United States, must recognize and must understand, because he's not dealt with these issues. He, he wasn't a professional politician and didn't deal with state affairs uh, in this geostrategic manner. He must recognize that the only future in Afghanistan it through political dialogue of all stakeholders involved. Can and at the same time, sir, one more point, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sir. When the foreign minister says that all the regional countries, or, or rather the neighbors of Afghanistan, should be on the same page, so to bring them on the same, it seems that they're, they're pretty much on the same page because, you know, just take this example of that building which, which was burning a day earlier. So primarily, that was a threat to PTV and to the neighboring building, you know, buildings around, rather than a building in F10 for that matter. So primarily, the issue is about the neighbors. So when the neighbors, they, they are, for example, do you think if they are able to formulate a strategy and they're on the same page, do you think they can have enough weight in their, in their you know, rather enough weightage to convince the other countries like India for that matter or, or, or the US? Well, you know, the, the problem here is we're talking about hard power. We're talking about real hard power, and the wider dimension of what's going on in Afghanistan is just a p 
part of the global picture. And Afghanistan was, I feel, invited to instill American power in Afghanistan as a fulcrum point to keep an eye on other countries, for example, China, Pakistan, uh, Iran, um, Central Asia vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, and, and, uh, and Russia. So, yeah, but they're doing this for their own purposes to maintain uh, global power uh, as a superpower in the world. And uh, it's not about right and wrong. It never has been. And we can't get moralistic about this. We have to talk in real uh, geostrategic terms on hard power and soft power and what that means and how to engage and not engage. Now, diplomacy is very important as soft power, an element to show. But we can't uh, misunderstand that there are real choices to be made by uh, countries with vested interests here. And you may say that uh, another building might be uh, not involved, but it has a stake in what happens because they're involved in Afghanistan for 16 years. And that, that, there, there's, that, that's a hard fact. And if we, uh, uh, as a community of neighboring states, want stability in Afghanistan and the Taliban say that the only way this is going to happen, and they've stated this from the beginning, if all foreign elements leave, because it's their country, yeah, then the United States must look for a peaceful departure in one way or another. Now, the thing with that is that they know full well that the current government in Afghanistan may not last as a result in the same manner that it is because funding may dry up, uh, training will, be, uh, will dry up most likely, and other, uh, the United States may get involved in other issues around the world which are more pertinent to its interests at this moment in time. So it, it's like a, a bus that's been running late and you're waiting for it and you wait more because you think it's coming and you've invested so much time whilst you've been waiting, so you wait a little more and you wait a little more, but how long are you going to wait until you realize it's not going to happen? And that's what victory is in the American mindset. It's not going to happen. Those people will there be there and continue to exist there. And it's a reality of Afghanistan being the center point of that, that area, which has been invaded from countless centuries, from thousands of centuries, Absolutely. from Alexander and before, who all lost. Every single, and Genghis Khan lost. And the British lost three times in a row. And the Russians previously twice and again lost. What does that indicate to you? Uh, I published, not published, but I submitted an article on structural organization of Pashtun society, for example, to indicate that that's the epitome of defensive structures. Yeah? And there's a reason for that. Because they don't want foreign interference. And it's going to come That's the heart of the matter here. Whether it's through Taliban or Pashtun nationalism or other form of Afghan nationalism, the fact of the matter is this is an Afghan issue and they've got to resolve it from within. And whatever government they impose upon themselves has to be negotiated from within. And it's their problem, really. We should help them. And that's where we have to get involved. And the neighboring states to allow a, an atmosphere to occur when we can allow them to sit down and thoroughly negotiate what their situation is. And that means other extra-regional forces must understand this situation. If they want this to That's very important. They should they, and they must. If they want this to continue the way it is, then carry on as you are. But if they want this to but change that's not yielding any and to sort benefit of Central Asia and benefit yeah. the region and yeah. benefit the world, then they have to take uh, a different direction in the way they're pursuing their power politics. Absolutely. Now, even sir, when we talk about victory, victory in Afghanistan, uh, for the current government in Afghanistan, victory means something else. They, in fact, uh, exactly do what the Americans tell them to do or what the Indians, in fact, uh, persuade them to do. When you talk about the victory from the uh, Taliban perspective, it is a totally different ball game. For our perspective, we want peace there. You know, it should be their own issue. Let them handle their way. But their way, there's no their way, sir. It's the American way. The problem is that victory has so many different meanings in Afghanistan. Do you, don't you think that there, there's so much division within, within their own ranks or within their own society or various uh, factors, I would say. There are Uzbeks there, there are Tajiks there, there are Pashtun element there. That, that is where the problem is. That You know, the victory has so many different meanings. That is where the confusion and the problem is. See, <clears throat> Afghans have been living as a nation for the last several hundred years. And... Uh, before 1979, Afghanistan was one country. They were living uh, peacefully. And it's only when the Russian invasion took place, subsequently the Americans came in, 
the jihad, so called that uh, got launched for 10 years that went on. And ever since until today, Afghanistan has not had peace. And uh, it would be incorrect to say that uh, they are used to this kind of life and they, they don't mind living the way they are living. They, they would definitely want peace. They would like to live a settled, stabilized, secure life. This is the 21st century, sir. And, uh, and I think uh, they would all agree on uh, the shape of victory that we just discussed, is that it should be a peaceful country. And they should all be able to coexist as they were coexisting earlier on. And for that, uh, all the regional countries and all the stakeholders must provide them that opportunity to sit together and resolve their uh, differences and settle and agree on a way of government in which everybody is represented and they can coexist and live peacefully and make the country peaceful. And we, uh, the regional countries have to provide that opportunity, to provide that environment where this can happen. Unfortunately, there have been attempts in the past, but they got sabotaged. I mean, we had two years ago the, 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 uh, the meeting in Murray where all these people got together and unfortunately the sabotage, yeah. the, uh, the leak, leakage of the news of Mullah Amr's death, death it, it just destroyed that entire process. And then when Mullah Mansoor was supposed to you know, indulge into this and he was uh, killed. He was killed. So unfortunately, we, we, uh, we can uh, see that uh, uh, s that America has not been very sincere because uh, that Mullah Umar's uh, news got leaked by uh, the Afghan security services, which are directly under the influence of the USA. And here, Mullah Mansoor. And Mansur the timing was really crucial. And Mullah Mansoor got killed Again? Through, through the American drone. So, it is America behind the two inc uh, incidents. And here were two opportunities where this process would have initiated and hopefully got completed. Uh, years ago, earlier, and Afghanistan hopefully could have been peaceful today. So, we, we, we ultimately, as and when Afghanistan becomes peaceful, it would be through this process. And for this process to uh, reinitiate, to develop, to pros uh, progress and culminate, all these stakeholders, especially the region countries, and of course, top it all, America have to, has to be interested in allowing it to happen. That is where the problem is. That is where the problem is. Unfortunately, they, they are not interested. They want uh, an Afghanistan which is not peaceful so that they have reason to stay and continue to influence the region, have a watch over the region and serve their own interests. Now, now, now another important point. Kelly, sir, uh, when, you, when you look at uh, the influence of the Chinese, obviously they, they have a border with them, though it's a smaller one, but still, they are the neighbors. Then you have Russia in the north. Another very important, and Russians have issues. And earlier, a few days ago, when we were having a chat, you did mention something very important that there, there are a lot of Muslims in Russia. Whether you talk about the Chechen yeah, issue yeah. Or, or the Uzbek issue, or, or you know, the those neighboring countries, these are Muslim countries. So they have a very legitimate concern. Yeah. And Vladimir Putin is a very smart guy. He has served as the KGB chief, and he's been there in power for so long now. And he understands the dynamics of this region. And he also understands uh, the, the mindset of Trump at the same time. That is also very important to understand. Now, two countries, primarily, uh, two countries, one is India, one is USA, present there in the uh, Afghan region, and now they have a different design altogether, or rather a different approach to set, or whether to settle or not to settle, that is a separate chapter. But they have a different, as compared to the rest of these uh, stakeholders. So there's a direct conflict of interest, sir. Do you really think this is the time that the Russians should step forward the Chinese should be a little more aggressive rather than issuing simple, you know, uh, within the brackets kind of statements, you know, and they should come forward. This is the time, sir. Do you think that is going to sort of give or provide some sort of uh, positive results for us or no? Yeah, let me just... Uh, because this is what Pakistani approaches yeah. at the moment. Uh, let me just second you what you're saying. First of all, Chinese interests are two very important and I'll tell you in priority. One oh, both primarily, sir. With Afghanistan, security then economic. I've been to Afghanistan, I remember going in a flight to, about, to Kabul maybe two, three times and every time I saw Chinese engineers in the flight. First is security, the, the Xinjiang province is facing, you know, you know, rebellion from those, the Uyghur, we call them, they call Uyghur, the Uyghurs. 
And for China, it's extremely important that the southern portion, which, which borders Afghanistan, remain secure because there have been reports of Uzbeks and others joining hands with these East Turkmenistan people creating serious trouble. I'm not saying they're very serious. For them, security comes first and economic rather. They have they have a lot of engineers working in mine field, uh, mines in Afghanistan. But security comes first. So for them, any initiative to stabilize Afghanistan will be very important and prudent. That's why they give a lot of importance to Pakistan. That's the reason we have seen Pakistan, Russia, meeting together. Russia, yes, you're right, Dagestan and Chechnya and others. And not, 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 not many, not much information comes out, but even then I'll tell you that situation in those uh, restive provinces with, with Muslim population is, has, is, not very, is not very positive. But that is the reason. For Russia, it's not economic. For Russia, it is stable Afghanistan in which they can secure their own interest, especially keeping these rest of regions, you know, uh, uh, peaceful. So this is very, very important for, uh, for them. And that, is a re the, and that is the reason that when our foreign minister finishes the tour of Turkey, he will be going to Moscow. And have you seen, Moscow has warmed up to Pakistan the last two, three years. And it's a very, very good sign. So all said and done, I think, uh, the countries with which we have now reached out, with which we are going now, they have a direct interest. What Professor Saab was saying about the United States, I would just say to them, sir, nobody is ignoring the United States, not, not the least. The United States has a very direct presence in Afghanistan for the last many years. But it is important also not to ignore, not to bypass the United States. Nobody can do that, not in the right mind. But to tell them that, look, you have, this is the... South Asian, what you call new policy you have taken out and about Afghanistan. But look, this is the countries. What they are saying to you, we are going to give you an independent opinion about that. So I think the United States will listen. That. Then another one thing before I come to India and, 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 and the United States saying Afghanistan, one thing is very important, sir, which we need to check that we are going to, we are going to share our concerns about what's happening in Pakistan and about what the other countries say. But we should also listen to their concerns also, sir. It's a dialogue. In diplomacy, you don't have a... Uh, one way. One way. Yeah. You need to listen. Now, other thing is, sir, you've given too much importance to, to India in Afghanistan. Uh, let me say to you... Sir, they are the main operators No, I, I agree. I agree. Ma major investors there. I agree, so they sir. Have sir, there. sir, they have, invest, they have investment. But United States, as you know, is a superpower, does not allow countries to cross a certain line. Believe what I'm telling you. And you talk about our President Trump. Yeah, partners, sir, 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 I tell you, it is the most unpredictable, unpredictable man. It's a strategic partner, yes. But do you think the United States will allow Afghanistan, India to cross a certain line in Afghanistan? Not the least. Economic interest is a totally different issue, sir. But boot some ground or creating problems or creating more influence than the United States, they will not allow. They have never allowed any country. So we should, we should, sir, wait, wait, okay. my, my now, opinion now, is that we should rest assured sir, now, now that why, India would stay where, where it is. Can sir, one, one very important point. Donald Trump, again, says that, you know, uh, it, uh, when he talks about the Afghan plan, I mean, he wasn't even clear what he was saying. He had no clue what he was talking about. And he said, well, you know, I have a plan, but it's a hidden agenda. And I'm going to give you a surprise. I mean, come on, you're the president of the United States of America, sir. I mean, what sort of a plan do you have? And even the, the Democrats, I mean, gave him hell for that. Like, the, And they said that he has no plan. He's just, you know, uh, staying for the heck of it. Now, when you talk about the Afghan policy, the person in charge is Ms. Wells, mm -hmm. who is the acting assistant secretary <laughs> of not only AFPAC, Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and no. South Asia. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and that also an acting assistant. So mm -hmm. what is that supposed to mean? And for the first time, I think, in the history of Pakistan, we've been able to say no to somebody. <laughs> and this <laughs> is what sort of weight we have given so to this us. Is, this is, sir. <laughs> the, what the, is that supposed to mean? The thing is, there is a reason. Look at what... Seriously? In, look at, look at in, in the last now nine months since President Trump came, a revolving door. His closest advisors have left him. Most of one, them. One, one after the other. This is the trust which he has developed. Now he's surrounded by all former generals. Military men, yeah. Military men. 
so there is no stability as yet and there is again i would reminded of president nixon's time mm -hmm. when he has deep distrust of the state department again the same thing state department believe or not is now looking for a role in president trump's time but, uh, that is the reason you have, you have, you have the acting, acting 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 charge in acting this thing this can happen in third world countries because these are issues of governance how can you have an important you know you they look they sit the in most important sir, institution sir they, they sit in camp david a very fine place to think and they come out where is the input of the state department do you see any in input <coughs> you just have boots on ground or beat this thing did thing state department never never acts like that sir because it is the repository of diplomacy they are the ones who reach out to the 24/7 they have they a very wise approach absolutely it's not the bomb which yeah. matters so, yeah? yeah but but uh, professor i'll just give you one example and i'll take this same debate forward i was <clears throat> going through an article a few weeks ago and something very interesting came out that was the kind of you know whenever you allocate a certain amount of budget you know for example if your defense spending is certainly you know uh, increased by 50% you understand that you know this is what the government is thinking or Uh, uh, on the other hand, let's suppose the development funds uh, for building uh, infrastructure or whatever, you increase that, that means that the government is looking uh, in another direction. Now, when you look at the kind of money allocated to Pentagon versus the State Department, Pentagon is getting 10 times more and that is around 650 B for billion dollars. Sir, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> well, you know... Uh Let's go back to the basics here. It's like a basic class. So practically, they're, they're, they're looking <laughs> at... I, I was just teaching global uh, strategic policy of global powers just before I came here. No, no, into little. When Trump came in, a lot of things changed. He reduced the budget. Was it about 40% of the State Department? And now his cabinet has more generals than it ever had since the Civil War in the United States. Uh, so that's saying some things. After 150 years, you've got so much what the influence is going to be. I think more than anything else is a statement of fact. The fact is that over the last couple of decades, especially the decade of half in Iraq and Afghanistan and other countries, the failures, the military failures, for example, and as a consequence, the diminishing of American prestige and influence around the world, they want this to stop. And they want this to stop only because they, re they think, not realize, they think that handshaking has caused this. It's a perceptional issue here. In a more aggressive White House, mm -hmm. more aggressive administration that wants to show teeth. You pull the handshakers back, you let the dogs out. To show we're not willing to take any more, you can't take it seriously because we were benevolent, mm -hmm. we're trying to shake hands, we're trying to build something up, and you don't understand liberalism because that's what happened after the end of the Cold War and everybody became more liberal until 9 11, for example, 16 years ago. And they became more realist in the approach. But however, they, that continued with the State Department. And now they're trying to say that if you're not going to take account of this and not going to take account of that we're still running the world and we've been nice and easy and happy with you, well, now we can take a more aggressive posture. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is how things happen. You reassess, you think that um, things are not working and they've not been working as far as American prestige is concerned over the last few years, last decade and a half especially and how things have gone wrong fundamentally around the world for their interests, and how China has outmaneuvered them in a way and circumvented them, especially in, in Latin America and Africa, because of the wars America's been involved in, and gained uh, uh, a certain upper hand as far as resources are concerned to build their engine of power and to rise up further. Now they want to change that, and they find it's more a reaction than anything else. And bringing more military into the cabinet would indicate, therefore, they're going to have a more realist approach to what's going on, a more offensive real, structure realist approach. Uh, and this is what I feel. And what does that mean? That means they're going to be able to push, or want to push the boundaries a little bit more. And the aggressive, aggressive uh, stance that they have is going to be more pronounced as the days go by. And this is not out of coincidence. When you've got so many generals, the influence factor is going to be different. The influence is going, uh, is going to be more military industrial capacity, mm -hmm. more military industrial interests, and what their interests are going to be more profound and lined, linked up to, to American policy. Because they're the policy makers now. 
and that's going to change the direction where America wants to stand itself because it feels that it's slipping from global power and it doesn't want to do so and it sees a threat from other countries, specifically China, who doesn't want to be a threat right now because it's not ready to be so. So I think it's to foment or to preempt any future threat and stamp out a position for a more prolonged period in global power. However along that line, nobody can predict, but I think this is uh, the wider picture that they're trying to attain and the projection of power is going to be more pronounced now, especially in the war of words with North Korea, but there can't be a war. An extended deterrence may never work as far as South Korea and Japan are concerned when it comes to nuclear issues. And now it was a period of dissuasion, but until North Korea could, um, for example, I'm taking it out of the, uh, the environment, but look at the wider picture. Until North Korea could project itself with a clear, credible deterrence, it couldn't come into deterrence. And you see, over the last week especially, that things have calmed down after the immediate reactions that occurred from the United States and other countries. That there's a realization that this is not going to be through war, and it's going to be through a negotiation now. The situation is different in Afghanistan. Um, when you talk about uh, the State Department, it's just about putting people back and putting other people forward. And the stance that you take. The British had these stances all the time when they had uh, the British Raj in India, for example. And they had the forward policy and then the reverse policy and the stature policy, meaning they moved back and forth depending on what the situation was mm -hmm. because they couldn't handle it. To an extent, when they had the forward policy in Afghanistan, they went in, they lost, they came back out, they reassessed and changed their minds, then they uh, made uh, SCR rules and this and the other, and then pushed forward uh, during the 1919 war of Afghanistan, which they lost, and then came back again. Yeah, although they said they won it, but that's a revision of history now. Um, so this is going to continue to occur until there's a realization, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, that there could be a win-win situation here. No, the, exactly. Not a zero sum where one wins. It can't be a zero sum. Is not the solution. And, and, and a win-win situation future, where everyone where future, everybody feels comfortable. What is that going to be like? But the future is how do you negotiate that out? And it's about negotiating. And with whom? Well, that's about negotiation starts. And mm -hmm. I've said this in other circles when uh, there's been formulation of new Afghan policy, for example, and I've been working involved in that partly. Um, and basically indicated that Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, the Taliban are working towards a negotiation position to gain as much territory as they can mm -hmm. until they come to a point where there's too much effort or too much disturbance within the Taliban structure to move and push forward with more conflict. Until they get to that point, they're going to continue and push as much. And I think it's come to that point where they, where they can have a leverage to negotiate for the future of Afghanistan. Now, you said that. Taliban were not on the terrorism list. They were, but they were taken off for the very reason that you can't, the United States cannot negotiate with the terrorist organization, so they were taken off the list. Mm -hmm. Now that they're not on the list and not seen officially as a terrorist organization, there is a prospect of negotiation. But this is a balance of negotiation, is it not? When you send in troops, it's to shore up the Afghan government and push it to a point of negotiation. We we'll may see new things happening because Three and a half, four thousand 4,000 troops can't do anything fundamentally when 30,000 troops uh, and with contractors, 50,000 troops came in in 2011, for example, 2010-11 when the Obama administration pushed them in. Yeah? What changed? Nothing. Nothing. In real terms. So this is just a negotiation strategy more are, than are, anything are, are, else. Are, are, now, sir, with war. Last quick comment, a minute for each gentleman, sir. Uh, you talk about the regional uh, players. You talk about the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and Pakistan and all, all those who are practically, you know, surrounding Afghanistan. Is it possible, is it possible, sir, that if these countries come together on, on, on something, you know, which is a unanimous kind of an agenda or something, and you can bypass what the Americans say and say, like, hold on, you know, you have done this for the last 16 years, hasn't yielded any positive results, so please stay quiet and let us do our job. It will be uh, very difficult to bypass. I'm talking about America. China, Russia, Pakistan, Iran. Because uh, being on the same page, sir. Of course. First of all, to get them on the same page uh, would be an uphill task. Uh, though, as far as Afghanistan becoming peaceful is concerned, they'll all they'll all will be on the same page. They would they would all want Afghanistan to be peaceful. And 
of course, it will it will take a lot of negotiation and a lot of diplomatic skills to get them ultimately to reach a, a policy uh, framework <coughs> to achieve peace in Afghanistan. And let's we can, uh, uh, suppose that they've been able to achieve that. Now, Americans have certain interests in Afghanistan. And uh, this policy, if it does not uh, cater to American interests, will not be acceptable to the Americans. And if we hope that uh, this policy would still get implemented despite uh, uh, it being contrary to the American interests while the Americans are present over there, um, would be too wishful. Too wishful. Kerry, sir? My <coughs> take on this is very simple, sir. The United States cannot be bypassed. Its economic and military force is brute. We just cannot in any manner. And let's not even talk about, uh, you know, bypassing the United States. Now, I... Forming, uh, forming a block. Sir, the, thing, sir, sir, the thing is, it will be extremely difficult to bring unanimity on these issues. But if, if certain, certain, you know, uh, parameters are drawn, and these countries agree on maybe two, three issues like, you know, bringing political stability of Afghanistan, you know, economic vibrancy, return of the Afghan refugees back, and allowing, allowing inside the other stakeholders, because sir, basically people forget it's a, there's a civil war going on in Afghanistan. If these countries can support and become in a manner neutral, not taking any sides, I think that sent the right signal. Maybe the Americans will be able to understand. But sir, in no manner, believe it or not in history, in the entire history of thousands of years, no country is so powerful economically and militarily as the United States is now. I can debate with any historian on this thing. So on that issue, sir, I think let's not even think about bypassing, but it's better to have a dialogue with the United States. Well, I think it's, 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 that, that's important uh, to recognize it, but I also think that when you mention block, I don't think it's a block per se, but I think it's a mutual understanding between particular countries. Or, or maybe common interests. Common interests and mutual understanding of shared interests within Afghanistan to form a certain amount of peace, so it, uh, it facilitates uh, uh, version in trade, for example, in the future. However, I think also that uh, it's not about bypassing, it's about having a common picture, so you pressure, you have greater pressure on the United States to accept certain interests of other countries rather than its own interests. And that's just a negotiating position. This is negotiations just done through war and conflict. But now we must recognize that other people are suffering for 40 years because of these negotiations. For whatever the reason may have been for intervention or not, now it must come to a conclusion. And the conclusion must be done politically. It can only be done politically. It can't be done through force. That's recognized. And what it is is Pakistan's and I hope this is their idea, that they foment a particular understanding between these different countries. And when the United States wants to sit down, that they're on a mutual platform and negotiate with the United States about their exit. Do you think that's the way forward? That's the only way forward. All right. Thank you very much, Jim, sir. Thank you. Kansa, and Professor, it's a pleasure having you all. And that's all we have uh, uh, for this hour. I'll see you tomorrow at 8. And then you take good care of yourself.